CYCPA Town Hall, a high-impact news broadcast to help you navigate the most pressing issues facing the profession. Get timely and critical information, real-time interpretation and analysis. Learn strategies, best practices, and capabilities to drive long-term success for your clients and organization. Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Alderson, one of your hosts. And as you can see, we're coming to you live from our New York studio. How good does it feel, Barry and Lisa, to be together? It's so awesome. welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. This is um, a great experience. So happy to be in the studio live with you guys. Well, we're great. It's great to have you, Lisa and Eric. Thank you for you know being such a force in leading all of this for us. I I tell you, you know, the world has changed back. My travel schedule is crazy. I think many of the members listening, you know, I I spent a lot of time out and about with members. I travel a significant amount of time, but the number one feedback I get, uh, either through email or whatever, is about the town hall series and and the value that people see in it. And so that's a real tribute to everybody participating, but it's a tribute to our team. The two of you have been stalwarts in that and a lot of other people that's been involved in it behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. So I just wanted to acknowledge that up front. And it's it's been a it's been a, a great service for our members. And so thank you. Thank you. Cheers to the town hall community. I mean, <laughs> you've played a huge, huge role. This is our power hour. I mean, this in some ways, Barry and Lisa, we view this as some of the most important time that we spend every other week. And we learn so much from your questions. We do think a lot about the information that we're going to convey. We look at, you know, the breaking news, but we also talk about strategies and today's show is going to be no different. We're going to cover some latest information on what's going on in Washington, DC, uh, from the regulatory front, from the tax front. Uh, and then we're going to move into a great practitioner discussion and really bring to life some of the things that we spoke on the last town hall, uh, with Ron Baker on. I'm thrilled that we get to have a, a strategic conversation with a, a small firm practitioner who's really made evolutionary changes in his business model. So I'm looking forward to it. And, and on the questions, we can't get to all the questions, but all the questions are dissected and, and, and characterized and evaluated, um, you know, in volume and things. And it, it does affect our planning and what we try to do, even though they may not be addressed, you know, in, articulated uh, in this particular meeting. Yeah, and they don't, and not just what we convey in the town hall meetings, but they actually impact how we think about things that we're, that we're advancing with, yeah, with the staff. Abso absolutely, and, and certainly on leading issues like IRS and all of those types of things, those, those questions are very much aligned with a lot of the advocacy work that we've been doing and a lot of cases being very successful because of people who are in the town hall exercising their advocacy voice with their members of Congress, having their clients do so if they're in public practice. Uh, and that's how the system really works. And you can't always get the right, exact perfect outcomes, but but it makes a difference. Well, let's get right into it. So here's the agenda. We already we already covered it, and we're going to kick things off uh, with Barry talking about what's going on in Washington D.C. And we will be introducing Gary Wood shortly. So Barry, uh, it's it's July 2022, and we've been talking about this uh, long and winding road since January of, uh, of this year. Uh, we were talking a lot at the start of the year about Build Back Better. Uh, that, that acronym, or BBB, has, has kind of gone away. Lost but its panache. Lost its panache. Well said. <laughs> and now we're focused on the reconciliation bill and, and what it will potentially eventually be. It feels like a lot longer than since January, to be honest with you. It's been... It, I've been representing the profession in Washington or in states literally since 1987. And I have, there's never been a bill that's yo-yoed as much as this particular piece of legislation. Uh, it's just been, it's been absolutely amazing. And you know, where we are today, really, uh, Eric and everyone listening is, is, a, is, you know, Senator Man, there was a lot of momentum to look like there was going to be another deal cut. And Senator, Senator Manchin, you know, stood up over the weekend really and said, no, I'm not going there really because of a couple of major issues. And that, really forces some political decision making uh, in the Congress. And, and really, it's going to be a reconciliation bill, and it's going to be very narrow. And the, and the importance of reconciliation, to just remind everybody, is it can pass the Senate with 50 votes. You basically get one of those a year, and it's got to pass by September 30th. 
And so um, what we're going to see really is it's going to almost be a health care bill. It's, it's going to have provisions in it related to uh, prescription drugs, the, the relationship between the Medicare program and prescription drugs to allow a different negotiation process to lower some of the cost in that. Uh, and then um, we're going to see some, some uh, fixing of some things in the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, um, as it relates to some of the credits and to make it, you know, solvent and things of that nature. There's bipartisan support that's likely to get through. Um, and in the end, you know, there's there's going to be political fallout on that. And you can see it positive or negative in, in that in that environment. So some so something we feel will occur. They're going to leverage this re reconciliation bill tactic. And when they do that, then that's going to enable potentially a couple of other bills to advance. Yeah. So first off, it will be a reconciliation bill, but it, it won't be a tax bill. So really, the reconciliation process that started was to get ta predominantly tax legislation, in some cases, some cer certain social activities, ESG being one topic, uh, through the Congress in that environment. Those other things will fall away. So there will be a reconciliation bill. Uh, and then what that by having that sort of behind the Congress, what it that's going to that's going to really free up a semiconductor bill, which, you know, it's got a bunch of different names to it. It's really targeted at how does the United States produce semiconductor or chips, if you will, uh, without as much dependency on China. Uh, and there's going to be a, a fairly large $250 uh, billion dollar bill here that's going to um, help. And some of you may have impact in this, some of your clients or ancillary services to some of these but to, to help support the creation of, of manufacturing facilities in the United States predominantly. There's other things in it that get put into any kind of political process, uh, but that frees that bill up. That probably wasn't going to pass because there was a fear that that was going to be a backdoor in some of the other issues, particularly a fear from the Republicans. And um, now those two things are probably going to line. In fact, the semiconductor bill probably will get voted on next week. Even the, and there's debate on that. I mean, you're you're seeing some editorials with the feeling that that, right that, or not, that yes. bill has grown now. It's grown to be much more than just a semiconductor bill. That, that's right. When bills move and have agreement, then you know, fa get fa added. favorite amendments get uh, get put into those types of things. And as long as they don't weigh it down too much, then the bill likely gets uh, gets passed. I think I think it's also really important for people to understand, though, that you know we're sitting here in in July. And you think about, well, you know, this the election's coming up. That seems like a long ways away in November. The reality is, I don't know, there's maybe maybe a dozen uh, days that Congress will meet between now and September 30th, which is when the reconciliation bill has to pass. Mm -hmm. um, there's generally a congressional recess. They could cut that short. Um, and then, you know, September, they come back after Labor Day. And there's just not a lot of work days there. And it clearly is an election year. And so the whole election process takes away a lot of those times. So I, I think those two major things, you know, basically a healthcare bill through the reconciliation process that's not tax. Right. And then I think the second thing is this so-called semiconductor bill. But it, it what you lose on that, and I think it's really important, is some tax extender issues that are out there are not likely to be in this. And we can talk about some of the lame duck stuff where that may come into it. Well, let's hit on that, Barry, but also the retirement bill. So there's a slight chance that that one could advance as which, well which before produces, the elections. Which, which I guess for people listening, yeah. it produces potentially, if it does pass, uh, potentially planning opportunities for clients mm -hmm. and things along those lines. So that's maybe the most important takeaway there. There is a chance that that gets through. Uh, it could. It's not probably as certain as the other two, but there is a chance that that gets through. And then, you know, the, the tax extenders issues, there's something about maybe like 40 or so extenders that are in process. The R&D one is probably the biggest one mm -hmm. that is not likely to be part of that uh, part of the bills that's moving now that almost assuredly moves into a lame duck session. We, you know, then the lame duck session has had some unpredictability. What is really the results of the election? You know, if the Democrat, if the Democrats lose control of the house, how big did they lose that by who actually not does not get reelected. And then, you know, members of Congress sought a way, am I be better off waiting to January when the new Congress is seated, or is it better to move something in? But tax extenders affects people on this call and their tax practices. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the odds are something will probably pass with tax extenders. Again, a lot of pressure on the, on the R&D side, 
But there are other sides that say no benefits to business unless we find some ways to put benefits into the bill to individuals like child care credits and things of that nature. So it, it continues, you know, post-election continues to be this horse trading that generally doesn't really move very far in today's Congress. So what we'll have, we've, we've had that for the past couple of years, come December, we'll be talking about most likely this tax extender bill getting, you know, rushed, rushed through Congress. And you see here on this slide, you know, some of the other bills that, that could make progress before midterms or, or shortly after midterms. And appropriations comes into play as well, which funds the government. You know, how long of a, a continuing resolution gets passed? You know, does it get it passed to the elections? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of moving parts. I think the takeaway is certainly from the elections to, you know, January 1 and into tax season, there's going to be some uncertainty. There's going to be some things that probably affect planning and, you know, particularly tax practitioners to a large degree. And you're not going to get a major tax piece of legislation and reconciliation. That's probably the two big takeaways here. Well, let's move into one more topic and then we're going to bring Lisa in and she's going to have a discussion with Ed Carl on some of the, the tax and IRS items. So there's been a lot of coverage over the past two weeks related to ESG, in particular related to you know climate and you know concerns around energy policy. We talked about this a couple of months back. So what we want to do is just take a quick step back and talk about the, the key drivers uh, of the ESG movement, uh, which is the market forces, a lot of investors demanding it, regulatory and, and standards. And what has happened over the past couple of months is we had the SEC come out with their uh, disclosure draft. And Barry, I want you to comment on that, 14,000 letters. And we've also had uh, the ISSB come out with their first two exposure drafts. Yeah, so uh, those are both big issues. And, and the SEC's proposal, which is part of the regulatory part uh, or the government part of the of the notion that uh, the three drivers here, it's different than the market forces of the yeah. standard setting, uh, is a massive proposal. There's a lot of criticism of it. Um, you know, does it go too far? I mean, I think there's more support of something, but it's not, you know, it's too much, you know, is probably the overarching theme. 14,000, it's actually, I think, closer to 15,000 letters that have come in got to be the world's record as far as response. A lot of senators and congressmen yeah, are writing just, everyone's writing letters. Yeah, And so, you know, the going through that by the SEC and its staff slows this process down. There's there's certainly a lot of threatened lawsuits related to it that will some will probably materialize depending on what the, the SEC does and how quickly it does. The elections, again, will have some impact on that, even though this is a regulatory process. You know, if control of Congress changes, that has a lot of ramifications from everything to budgets to how hearings are structured and, and the whole debate. So but at the same time, I really think it's important for the profession to understand there are other forces there. There are market forces still happening. There's global business forces and much, much of the bi large business community or global com uh, companies. There's clearly things happening in the ESG space around the world. Um, including in China, even though that may sound a little far-fetched, there are things happening, at least in certain stratas in the, in the Chinese business environment with ESG. And there's a big component of the profession on reporting and ultimately assurance. And um, that's going to continue to evolve. It's going to move faster in Europe than it is in the United States, but it's going to move. Um, and how it moves, whether it's going to be significantly market-driven or it's going to have some regulatory components. It's going to be how the SEC reacts to these rules. Now, the ISSB is the new global standard setter. There's not going to be a U.S. standard setter in this space. It's going to be a global standard setter. Um, they were, you know, they came out of COP26 last November. It was announced the formation of it. We've been instrumental in how that gets done. Um, that, in fact, this week, that board is meeting for the first time in public sessions. There are exposure drafts that are out there um, and there's going to be additional work that's being done, standards adopted even by the end of this year. So this is going to move, you know, pretty quickly uh, in that environment. So we've got some questions, even some questions coming in on what is ESG. There is a ESG Resource Center on the AICPA's website. You just go there to the search engine, type in ESG. And it's about ESG. You know, the acronym is spelled out here, environmental, social and, and, and governance. 
And the when, environmental is really is driving what, the train right now. Driving the train. And Barry, when you, and I'm just going to click, we're not going to cover, I'm going to come back, we're not going to cover, the, re, read these quotes. But, you know, debate sometimes helps. And we, we actually just held an ESG symposium right here in our, in our New York office. We, we convened a group of 60 leaders uh, from companies, standard setters, you know, governmental officials, firms. And, you know, we talked about where things stood with ESG and the role that, that firms can play, or if you're a finance professional, the role you need to play in your company. And this dialogue probably will make it better. It's a positive. So you've got some headwinds right now, you know, people concerned related to how this is impacting energy policy. With that, all that said, there is a real interest on kind of addressing some of these matters. Yeah, and it is a balance with the other yeah. things. And so it's not taken in sort of a, um, you know, a, a, a hermetically sealed, you know, environment there. It is, in fact, an a ecosystem, uh, in not only for environmental, but for the other business issues. So even, so it is, in, it's going to happen in Europe. But even, say, in Germany, they've backtracked from some of those things today because of the, the, the war between Ukraine and, and Russia, the, the invasion by Russia. And the and the the prices of, of energy, and so they they have a real issue. I was actually in a meeting last week and with, with some German accountants, and you know they were shutting off the the pipeline in, from Russia to Germany for repair and maintenance. And the big fear is that when it in about a week when it's ready to be opened back up, Russia doesn't open the other end of it and feed the the source of energy, and so that creates a huge problem. And so mm -hmm. these things have to be balanced in that prospect. And by the way, thinking, yeah. talking about balance and regulation, um, I, I do want to count one thing because you, we've talked about the SEC in this, and and um, th there's a high-profile finding in the SEC uh, related to ethics in the profession. But the profession is under a lot of scrutiny in the public company space. But I want to address on one important point because the media has sort of gotten this wrong. Uh, there was one of the big firms that was uh, part of that, and there was. Um, reporting that there was cheating on the CPA exam, and that was not the case. It, it is the case that's in the media, but it's not the case that is the reality of the fact pattern. So I just wanted to cover that particular point. There's a lot of moving parts behind the scenes on that, but um, it wasn't characterized correctly. Well, thanks for that clarification. And as we conclude that, that segment on ESG, what we're thinking about with ESG is how we can help, help the firms or help members in business and industry understand how to how to how to how to process this so this is something that we're working on uh thinking about from a from a training strategy standpoint as well as a solution standpoint and you know you have other it's a different category you look at sock reports and that's a category that's evolved over a number of years this this one could evolve much quicker than what we saw with sock reports but if you you know we went from sas 70 to, to, to the sock one and two and three reports and there's just these these are uh, uh, evolutions that occur due to market forces. Right. Easiest way to think about it is for literally almost 100 years, 90 years since the 1933 Securities and Exchange Act, the information flow from business to to government, to lenders, et cetera, have been about financial statements. In the U.S., we would call it gap basis financial statements. That world is shifting to be a broader set of information, in some cases environmental, in some cases social information, strategic information. And it's about will the profession provide assurance, reasonable assurance, uh, maybe limited assurance over the full set of information. Not So financial information plus. And that's really where the world's moving to. And it's a great, it's important for the profession to be skilled up to be able to handle that. And even in the SEC proposal, there is provisions about the, the, the profession attesting to some of this information. It's contained in the European proposals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily someone handing it to us. We have to own it by having the skill sets to be able to do that because the, the world wants to trust us in putting that information out in a reliable fashion. Well, we're, we're going to move now. There's a bunch of questions that have come in. There was a question, Barry, that actually came in related to the, the matter you just talked about on how the media, maybe n media not getting it right related to um, that investigation uh, recently that was was covered in the in the press. The other a c a couple of questions that have come in and it's 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 related to ESG is, you know, does the AICPA support 
you know, what the SEC is doing or support this ESG movement. So maybe a comment just on that. I think what, what we're trying to do is just support the role of, of providing information and trust to the markets. Here's how I describe it. There's a lot of emotional debate about what is happening, particularly in the environmental space. And, and it's pretty polarized and it's pretty passionate. And that's okay. I mean, just talking about in the general public and it's reflected in our membership, clearly. But, you know, what ultimately solves debate is transparency and reliability of information. Does this particular initiative help the environment or not? Does it, is it net positive or net negative with, with say, greenhouse gases, et cetera? Standards that measure that and reliability and consistency that that's done fairly, consistently with some, some level of assurance will tell that story. Over time, it will tell that story one way or the other. And it will prove some people right and some people wrong. And what our profession is, if you think about financial information, the financial success of a business, an audited financial statement proves either that's going to, you know, the company is, is in fact making money or not making money based on the standards. And that's what's happening in this particular space. And that's a, you know, a bit of an oversimplification, but in a large way, measurement and transparency and ultimately assurance in this space is actually the answer to some of this emotional debate. Well, thanks. And we'll, we'll be talking more about this in future town halls. So Lisa, Let's pivot now to a discussion with you and Ed Carl about the IRS and tax. Thanks, and good to see you, Ed. Well, uh, Lisa, Ed, nice to see you in the uh, studio there. Thank you. I'm going to read you a quote that I'm looking at in the Q&A live. This is a live show, as Eric likes to say. I am totally exasperated with the IRS customer service and practitioner PPS hotline. What are we doing about it? So I think that's a great lead in for the conversation you and I are going to have today. So well, you know, we can talk, jump to that right away. We were going to talk about that in a minute, but let's just get to that question. You know, Barry, a moment ago, talked about the Q&A, and we don't always answer them on the uh, town hall, but we um, it influences our thinking what we do. Well, here's a good example. Two weeks ago, I was monitoring the questions, and I saw a million <laughs> questions about the uh, PPS hotline, and um, I spoke to our committee that deals with that. We we have a letter in the works about that. Um, actually, the committee is meeting right now as we speak, and we're um, working on that issue. Unfortunately, part of the answer to uh, customer service on the phone lines is that a lot of those folks were shifted to the surge teams, and the surge teams were put in place to work the the backlog down. So as they take those people away and frankly we have supported the surge team work um, that the backlogs have got to be drawn down um, but we are trying to address the specific issue on pps as well at the same time thanks ed i know i kind of threw that one at you so let's let's go back and talk about the the backlog that we're seeing um the the back button isn't there we go got the back button to work okay so uh, Ed mentioned that he looks at the Q&A on the, the town halls. We continue to see the frustration and questions about what is going on with the backlog. So we pulled some of the latest information that's being reported, 11 million unprocessed 2021 individual returns, 9.3 million of those are paper returns. Then we get into the 941s and the 941Xs. We can't figure out, we don't know what's a ERC, 941X, but still the IRS is saying about 196,000 of those unprocessed. So, Ed, um, what, do, what yeah. are you thinking about the backlog? So, so that data is important to look at, but there is a big problem with it. It, it doesn't have context. Um, there's no comparison to calendar norms. There, That's all missing. Um, frankly, the IRS put out an information release on June 21st indicating that they're making significant progress on the backlog. And frankly, they are making progress. But the very next day, National Taxpayer Advocate Erin Collins uh, released her mid-year report to Congress uh, uh, expressing a lot of uh, concern about the backlog. She, she, and to quote her from that report, to date, more than twice as many returns await processing compared to historical norms at this point in the calendar year. We don't know what 
the the backlog is exactly uh, we we don't know what the the numbers are frankly that is a focus of a lot of the advocacy work that we've been involved with Lisa if we go to the next slide um, you know you see the first button there transparency is really important to us we met with the IRS several weeks ago and you know, we told them the takeaway out of this meeting is the transparency. It has to change. It has to improve. It has to get more complete because they're working hard. They're doing a lot of things. They're drawing down the backlog, but we don't know. For example, what are they anticipating come September 15th and October 15th when we get to the end of the extended filing season? What happens to the backlog then? We, we don't know. So we're trying to do a lot of work dealing with the, the transparency and completeness of this. As I said, in a meeting, we understand that uh, a prominent senator is in the process of uh, moving a letter through Congress. Uh, there could be more. It could grow to be a bipartisan letter directly to Commissioner Reddick. And we understand that in that letter, they will be asking some detailed questions about the backlog and about the, the numbers and what they mean. You know, and two oversight committee hearings this past spring, Commissioner Reddick promised that we would be back to healthy levels by the end of the year. So what, what does a healthy level mean? I mean, in my mind, it means pre-pandemic inventory levels. The IRS doesn't finish their work at the end of the day. There's always some kind of an inventory. But we don't know what healthy means exactly. We're trying to get answers to a lot of these questions. The real key for us and for our members, we've already been through three um, backlog or, or pandemic influence filing seasons. Lisa, we speak a lot about what's on our members' minds. Filing season in a normal time is not so good. It's not easy. Right. But when you have three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back pandemic backlog influence, we don't want a fourth one like that. And that's really deeply on our minds. And so a lot of what we are recommending in this particular letter is focused on that healthy backlog by the by the beginning of next tax season. We have longer term recommendations that we've talked about on previous town halls and, and Ed has um, committee members that are looking into the strategic plan that the IRS just released. So we'll be continuing to monitor what their plans are, but we really wanna get them to focus on getting that backlog to healthy levels. Ed, one of the items you and I talked about is that first time abate. So can you give me just a little bit more on, on that special first time abate that, that we're recommending. Right. So um, a lot of our members know that the IRS correctly and um, uh, appropriately created what they call first time abate. And what that means is though it's a, a quick use of the reasonable cause rules to get rid of a penalty. Reasonable cause um, when a penalty is assessed against the taxpayer uh, allows them to say, you know what, it, it, the penalty was assessed for a good reason, but this is a, a, a usually compliant taxpayer. Let's get rid of it. First time abate was a system to get rid of those penalties in a much quicker, uh, easier fashion. But taxpayers can only use it once in every three years. And, you know, we're talking about entering a fourth filing season under, under the um, auspices of COVID hanging over us. It's mostly gone. We're talking about getting back to normal, but there are still problems out there and taxpayers may have used first time abate because of, um, because of COVID. And we've heard from many situations where they qualified for plain reasonable cause, not using the special first time abate Yet IRS said it's easier to, easier to use first-time abate. So they used up a taxpayer's one in three years first-time abate. And there's still a lot of problems. So we're trying to get IRS to consider as a way to help them draw down the backlog, just getting rid of some of these 
penalty notices in, in a much, much easier fashion, even for taxpayers who might have already used first time abate uh, in the last three years. And, and so it still allows those who haven't to reserve it for the next several years. So it's, it's as we call it, a special use um, to help IRS with the backlog. That sounds like a, a, a good recommendation. So I wanted to spend some time talking to you about some of our favorite topics. We already talked about um, practitioner priority service hotline, but what are you hearing about ERC? So, yeah, we, we hear a lot from members on ERC. We've been tracking. We have a committee that tracks it as well, and we're in touch with them on a daily basis. We're, we're, there are still problems. No, don't get me wrong. But we're hearing that things are moving in the right direction. What we were originally hearing that it was taking eight to nine months on average, for many people, more than a year or more to draw down um, to get response to um, amended 941s and for taxpayers to get their money. Um, I'm hearing now that people are getting, taxpayers are getting their checks in about five months. Uh, several uh, committee members who I spoke to over the last couple of days are saying that claims they filed in February and March are just starting to come in now. So. So it's still taking longer than average. It's there are still, I'm sure there are outliers out there and plenty of problems that our members are having, but it looks like it's moving in, in the right direction. So i um, very pleased about that. And we've talked in the past about the aggressive marketing claims around ERC. So just that's still on our radar. We know that there is still um, high levels of interest in that. Yeah. Um, even, even hearing about um, IRS developing its its audit strategy around ERC. So, in in about a minute, Ed, um, any any additional thoughts on ERC? Yeah, the the, the IRS de delays exacerbate that kind of a problem. But I would warn our members off these groups. Keep keep away from them. One one CPA told me that one of these marketing companies a approached him to prepare the amended returns on, on a fixed fee basis. Meanwhile, these marketers are getting a contingent fee for bringing in the taxpayers to them. Uh, it, it, and they're using um, approaches that are not commonly accepted by CPAs who we know uh, are, are appropriately filing returns. So stay away from them, from them as the CPA did. Also, you mentioned um, audits. Those are starting to happen. We're starting to see um, IDRs, the, the information requests that agents are making, and they're, they are being very thorough, and they're going into the areas that these marketing um, aggressive marketers are maybe playing a little loose with. IRS is asking for a lot of detail in those areas. So it's starting to happen appropriately. Um, we knew that they would start to audit and look for problems and look for fraud, and that's going to happen. Thanks, Ed. Um, really quickly on Schedules K2K3, um, we've been advocating with the IRS for additional guidance to be released around that. And um, Ed has uh, indicated that our task force is going back to the IRS with specific areas where we think that additional guidance is needed. And then um, they're hoping to get that out in time to be helpful for the September 15. Yeah, it has months. to be done very quickly. We're working, yeah. we're trying to move that along. So we'll keep you guys um, apprised of any developments in any of these hot topics. And we appreciate all of the comments that are coming in on the, the Q&A. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. So Lisa and Ed, thank you. Now we're gonna move to a good, you know, practice practical discussion with with Gary Wood. I'll let you introduce uh, Gary Wood. I think this is such an important portion of the town hall where we really try to discuss strategies, but then also discuss the implementation of these strategies with practitioners. Thank you, and and Gary, welcome. Gary is with CRC. It's an accounting firm in Missouri. He is a Leadership Academy grad, I think you said class of 2018. And um, 
after we had the conversation with Ron Baker on last week's town hall, um, Gary's firm came to our attention because he's he's really done some great work in, a, in evolving his firm. And that's why we wanted to bring him in to have a, a conversation about it. So Gary, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your firm. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, it's actually really great to be on the uh, podcast with you guys on the town hall. Long time listener, first time guest. And it's uh, personally extra special for me to uh, be a guest when Barry's speaking as well. I've got to spend some personal time with Barry through the Leadership Academy and then also special invites to executive roundtables there in the New York studio. And I always respect that I, through the Leadership Academy, I got to hear his personal story of his journey through the profession. Um, he's served in his role at the AICPA for a while. So you forget that he actually, you know, practiced and had some difficult career choices between firms along the way. And then in his role, uh, just leadership through Enron, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, things like that. So those that know me well here in Missouri know that I routinely speak about Barry's thoughts on the profession, constantly stating, you know, Barry says this or Barry says that like he's my next door neighbor. Um, <laughs> and so I generally have to explain, um, not everyone in Missouri knows who Barry is. So I generally have to explain if there was a Tom Brady or a LeBron James of the profession, he would be our goat. So truly an <laughs> honor to be here with Barry. I think he's blushing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not sure he likes the Tom Brady now. <laughs> <laughs> he, he gets it. <laughs> um, so Gary, how many people do you have in your firm and where are you located? Yeah, um, real quick, I skipped over just my, my personal journey through the profession, um, 16 years in the profession. Uh, eight of those years working for a 30, 40 person firm out of college. Uh, what I always like to say about that experience was that they trained me uh, well enough that I could leave, but but treated me well enough that I stayed. And I was grateful to have an incredible mentor at that firm. And the mentor story is really kind of important as we get into the later conversation, because I felt like my mentor um, really taught me what it meant to have business acumen and then uh, what it, how important it was to use that business acumen uh, with your clients. And so as he was teaching me about um, business acumen, I actually got to uh, witness his acumen leading a certain company through generational succession, three generations of succession in the company. And at the end, um, of the founder's life, my mentor was actually given the eulogy at um, the founder's funeral. And that always made an impact on me because I knew when I got into the profession, I wanted to have these deep, meaningful relationships with my clients. And I got to witness that uh, with my mentor. So that always had an impact on me. But as he taught me about acumen and I went out on the uh, pursuit as a young CPA to gain acumen, I started attending national conferences hosted by the AICPA, whether it was Engage Conference, Digital CPA, things like that, started learning of some of the trends in the profession. And as I would come back to that firm, they were a very departmentalized firm, tax and audit, and so, and a very successful firm. And so it was hard to get your seat at the table when it came to change management to introduce topics like CAS and some of the trends that, that I, you know, even early phases of cloud accounting, business process outsourcing, things like that, that I was getting excited about, you know, a decade ago, learning about through the conferences, it just didn't fit into those departmentalized models. And so fast forward, you know, eight years into my career, I get this opportunity to actually acquire a firm in my hometown. And, you know, it was a hard decision at that time in my life because I wasn't necessarily unhappy with the firm that I was at. I was frustrated with the change management, but certainly not unhappy. Um, but this was a chance for me to really, you know, step out and take that entrepreneurial journey for myself and take a chance on myself. And so um, eight years ago, acquired a small firm in my hometown. Um, my wife's contingency on that was she wanted me to bring on a business partner to go on the journey with. She knows how relational I am and she thought it would be very important to have a business partner. So we have led that firm for the last eight years and really modernized, you know, what started as a 30 year old legacy sole practitioner firm. It was a very high volume uh, tax shop. 
And I'm happy to say that we we've, we've really modernized that firm into a, a what a firm of the future now. So I think um, one of the reasons we were successful in doing that um, is we just like we would tell our clients to trust the professionals when we set out on the journey to um, rebrand and, and change the way we were viewed by our clients. We used a marketing company and a branding specialist to really help us um, help our clients rethink who we were to them and things like that. And I think you guys have one of those marketing uh, snippets that you were wanting to share with uh, the audience today. Yeah, let's roll that video because I think it will show just the true value that you've placed on building a relationship focused um, practice. So let's let's watch a quick video. The most fun that we have in our work is starting with someone in an early phase of their life cycle and then being that confidence and being that support to help them advance. So when my journey started with an opportunity to be self-employed and start my own business, I met with CRC and was scared to death and they weren't. They held my hand and gave me the, the confidence that I needed to take the next step. They can see the future and predict what's going to happen administratively and financially for me, which is really important. And because of that, I've been able to grow my business by double in the last couple years. There was a time in my life where all I was was an order taker. It was just a checkbox on a compliance checklist. The more I went through that cycle, the more I started to realize that that wasn't meaningful to me. We design our life cycle plans so that the tax returns a byproduct of that experience. All right, so I think that that's um, a, a great example. Um, let's, um, you, you pulled out a couple of key themes from your video there. And one is that you don't wanna be an order taker and you want the tax return to be a byproduct of the relationship that you've been building with your clients. So let's talk a little bit about, let's dig into your journey. And um, for those of you that download the slides that we've pulled out that quote from Barry. So you'll have that to refer back to, but let's dig in. Let's start getting into how you took your, your traditional compliance-based firm into this trusted advisor relationship-driven um, practice. Yep. I think, you know, piggybacking off of a great session with Ron uh, two weeks ago, you know, he, your audience, I'm sure, has a lot of questions, just like I did the first few times that I heard Ron speaking. He, you, you understand what he's saying, but from a practical matter, you're like, how does this apply to my 13-person firm in small town Missouri? How do I make this work? And one of my favorite things that Ron said two weeks ago, he acknowledged that the quickest way to, to get to that concierge subscription-based model is very likely just to launch a completely new brand. And, and we deliberated that in the early phases um, eight years ago. We knew it would, it would, for a legacy firm, 30-year-old legacy tax firm, it would be really hard in a long, slow process to kind of convert to the transform to this new model. Um, we chose not to go that way, but I was really happy to hear him acknowledge that that was, that, that could be a path forward for a lot of firms. You know, when I think about that, I think about launching, you know, firm name VIP or firm name plus to really, you don't have to necessarily completely launch a new firm name, but maybe you're launching, um, a different service line, a different concierge mindset, um, to get there quicker, but like the slides lay out here, really great. Um, the first step in our journey, um, which is not necessarily a Ron Baker value pricing principle, but for us, it's what worked. And it was a baby step for us to get into Ron's th philosophies was we just moved our legacy clients into a fixed pricing model. And what I tell firms about that is I... To me, you know, in commerce, there's always a trade-off. Sometimes it's a trading off a service uh, for a payment or for currency. But in this regard, that, of course, is happening. But it's also a mutual trade-off 
It's a mutual commitment between the firm and the client to say that we're going to hold space. We're going to reserve capacity in our busy schedules to provide this future service. And as a trade-off for that, all we ask is that you pay us monthly to do that. So that mutual trade-off was really important. And when we presented it to our clients eight years ago, and we branded it as common sense billing, if you go to our website or see any of our marketing material, you'll hear us present it as common sense billing. It's, it's really just a fixed pricing agreement model. But that helped us start this um, process. And I would tell you the biggest thing that it did for us is when you got to the end, we call it a service plan, but when you get to the end of a 12 month cycle of a service plan, it memorializes the renewal of that service plan. And that's where step two comes in. As we got better at fixed pricing agreements and we were able to memorialize the end of that fixed pricing ag uh, agreement, it opened the door to a lot of opportunities for our firm to start to build in value adding or value pricing services that we had never offered before. Behind the scenes, we developed a workflow and a system and we're very process driven. And we were designing that behind the scenes. And then when we got ready to roll it out, when we got to the end of a 12 month cycle of a service plan and it was time to renew that service agreement, we could have the conversation about what went well and what didn't go well. And we could start to add in and, and layer in um, services on top of that. So and I'll just I pause. Like about, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I'll just, before we go to step three, let's pause there. Yeah, what I like about that is the annual renewal process takes away just the um, same as last year mentality. It, it gives you a trigger to say, let's sit down and evaluate what went right, what went wrong, and, and have a conversation with the client about what their expectations were, and then how to meet the, the outcomes that they're after. So I like that approach. Well, Lisa, we're getting, we're getting a lot of great questions. Uh, Gary, they're, they're really enjoying listening to your story and your journey here. Talk a little bit about, you know, we got some you know, specific questions on how to how to go about this, one being the engagement letter. How did, how did you manage your engagement letter process? We worked with our professional liability carrier and made sure that they were in agreement with the services we were offering and the engagement letters that, that we were providing. Yeah, the, the scope in those in engagement letters is really important and making sure that the services you're, being, you're expecting to provide to your clients are covered by your professional liability carrier. So, but um, good answer, good answer, Gary. Um, let's move into step three. So you've got um, your annual renewal and then how have you been adding in the advisory? Yeah, so between step one and step two, a lot of the what went well, what didn't go well conversations were, well, you know, being a high volume tax shop at the time, we're making this transformation, you know, well, I was really caught off guard by my tax liability or I, I didn't have time to prepare for it. Um, so we started building in those proactive models of, of tax planning. That was really just step two was just getting better at um, systematizing being process driven in providing that tax projection and tax planning service, getting our team um, built up where they could annualize profits and start to predict uh, tax liabilities and things like that. Step three was really more, it's been a try, it's certainly a trial and error um, process. But, you know, one thing that I always came back to the firm after networking, I'm, I've, help charter a small firm networking group that has provided um, through the PCPS, through ASCPA's PCPS, small firm networking group, but um, really has provided a ton of insight and a ton of community um, for me. And one thing that I always learn from networking with them, as well as at conferences with other practitioners, is really just this feeling on demand, you know, so many CPAs wearing their busy badges, busy, 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 and feeling on demand and keeping up with email and, you know, questions coming in, phone calls, checking on the status of tax returns and so much of that. Um, we really wanted to, we try through the trial and error, we tried layering in, you know, unlimited communication to our clients. That didn't go incredibly well. 
Um, so we had to kind of move off of that. But the one thing I would tell you I didn't even like about the unlimited communication model was it really put the client in the driver's seat of when they should be contacting you. And when we moved into step three, which was which is where we're at now with our advisory services, um, my partner group and I read a book by Cal Newport called A World Without Email. It was very powerful for us because in that book, he talks about synchronous communication versus asynchronous communication. And, you know, a lot of things we learned through the pandemic about doing exactly what we're doing right now was you could actually have better communication if you got outside your email inbox and had more access points with your clients. So the big step in step three for us is, and if, you, if you've watched the whole video from our homepage, you'll notice that part of our secret sauce and our service plans is we follow a concept that we frame up as the life cycle of a business. And we view every entrepreneur's journey differently. And we try to segment each one of our clients and pin them into a profiled life cycle of their business. What that helps us do is acknowledge proactively how many access points with their advisor they're going to need during the year. Believe it or not, the lower level life cycles need more access in shorter sprints. They don't need half day on-site visits, but they need more 30 minute phone calls with their advisor and things like that. Versus the more mature businesses, they don't need a lot of weekly check-ins or monthly check-ins or things like that to keep up just for quick questions and insights. But they do need those deeper dives. Like when you're going to do a strategy session with a mature business, you're going to spend a half day on site with their C-suite executive team. And you're going to want to get everyone's seat at the table and have those high level conversations. So it's less access points, but longer access points. So that's been a journey for us of defeating the, you know, continuous email inbox chase and actually getting in our clients viewing us more as advisors rather than just sending emails. That's great. Well, Barry, maybe you want to get in here with a question. I'll just, I, as you, as you, before you do, just, I wanted you just to comment, Gary, you and I talked earlier about just the client accounting services opportunity and, and how you, how you're thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, somewhere between uh, actually probably in step two and definitely step between step two and step three, we um, began adding the the accounting services using cloud based accounting, using, you know, cloud based expense management apps. And that's the thing I always say is like tax is always the anchor of the relationship but it doesn't have to be the value proposition because like the video says, that's the compliance piece. And so we started as a tax firm, we built in the accounting services and now we're building in the advisory services. Gary, I was, great story as far as the journey and how to implement it. I wonder if particularly in your box three or level three relationships with clients, if there are any generational disparities between how entrepreneurs in different generations react to what you've built, um, do you get any kind of different reactions in that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, generationally, we still have in-person meetings. Some generationally, they, they want to come to the office and have the consultation. But other generations are, are perfectly fine just jumping on, you know, a video chat and having that quick 30 minute sync depending on how often we scope that out in their in their scope of work but but definitely the way we're accessing our clients generationally generationally has changed certainly and do you get any feedback from your clients you described in your own journey a couple of points that were i think you actually used the word fear you know it was how do you leave the firm and go to the different place that you went you know the the, the thought of buying a firm and then of course even implementing this strategy there was a some trepidation at least that I, that you described in your journey. Do you look at that from a client perspective and see where their trepidations are to really hone in the services? Yeah, I think, uh, I think as a profession, the number one thing our clients want from us is access, is conversation, is candid conversations. But I, I don't know that we do a good job, and this goes back to the marketing and branding. I don't know that as a profession, we do a good enough job letting our clients know how to access us. And that's why we get frustrated when we have to chase our email inboxes or we have to keep up with the voice messages. Because I think what the clients desire is the access, 
but we don't productize the access in a way that it packages up nicely for them. That's well said because you're productizing the access, which is how you can really be the trusted advisor because they are freer to come to you. I think that's what some of the things that Ron Baker uh, preaches as well. And I, and I think also last thought on that is just that, um, that the number one fear that I hear from people trying to get into a subscription based model. And, it, and this was our trial and error with unlimited communication is what if we do a subscription model and we have some abusers of the system, you know, what if they're calling every day with questions? And I think that's a fear that we have to get over because in our journey, certainly there were a few, but they were the minority and they were the outliers. And we were able to address those on a one-to-one -one basis. It, I don't want that fear to disrupt anyone from moving to this model just because they think, what if we do this flat rate monthly pricing and then we're getting hundreds of emails from one client? Well, you just deal with that on a one-to-one -one basis as an outlier. Barry, uh, Gary, great concluding remarks. Lisa, Gary, great discussion here. We literally are going to be a lightning round here. We only have a couple of minutes. One question that came in, which I think is a fair question. They said, is the AICB going to pull the membership on where they stand with ESG? It's almost like, they met Barry, say, it's like pulling the membership. Do they agree with the tax bill that's on the table? Yeah. So No, I mean, we're not. So our position on it is, is pretty simple. We think it's a market driven activity and, and we're not, you know, we're not uh, advocating for the SEC to adopt. And we fully acknowledge as humans, as, as citizens of the U.S., the, the profession is is probably very polarized on that issue and can be very polarized, for instance, on, on tax, tax strategies. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think the important thing to do to step back from a profession perspective is to understand the what we are about as a profession is measurement, trusted advisor, as Gary just described, those types of things. And if the world is moving to this process, even if you disagree with it, that doesn't mean that the profession shouldn't be involved with it from the standpoint of being a solution provider. And, and as I said before, that there are, look, I have been in sessions where people have argued certain types of environmental issues are actually negative, even though they're sort of positive, positive to be positive. Well, the way you have that debate, the way you solve that problem is to have measurement and transparency associated with it. And that will prove the point as opposed to people's you know, unfettered opinions on that issue. And that's what we're about. We're a profession that measures and provides reliability in it. And the other thing is, I mean, there's comments that, you know, there's so much work right now, you know, why do we need more work? And this is where, you know, there needs to be intentional strategies from the firms, as you, as you just heard from Gary. And and then there's some firms that I know, I've spoken to some firms, they want to they be in this area. They've got staff that are passionate about it. And how do you go about it? So this is you absolutely don't have to you know build up build out an ESG practice. Well, it's just like some firms don't do audits, some firms don't do individual tax, some firms only do certain types yep. of individual tax. It's not you know we have forty four thousand firms in this country. Not every firm does exactly the same thing, and the professions you know place in society in in helping society be more prosperous and effective is not singular either. Well, we, we covered a lot today. We covered the latest in D.C. Great discussion from Ed and Lisa on the latest uh, with, with tax and IRS issues. And, and then we, I thought, really expanded on what Ron Baker shared with us in the last town hall. You might want to go back and listen uh, to the last town hall to hear some of Ron Baker's theories now that you've heard some of these practical execution tips uh, from, from Gary Wood. So here's the past town halls. We also have a, a webinar coming up uh, uh, later this month related to uh, the fractional CFO service and really playing that advisor role. So this is something that, that you might want to leverage. And this is in some ways where Gary's taking his practice. Lisa? This is a upcoming webcast that is being sponsored by our young member committee. So I wanted to make sure to bring it to your attention for those of you who are learning to build out some of the softer skills that will help you advance in the profession, we've got great insights from one of our very active young members. Once again, subscribe to the newsletters. We're going to be providing additional information uh, related to some of the questions that came in related to that last section. I mean, I know there's 
people asking about what book that was and information about Gary's website. We'll get that out to you. Uh, thank you for those uh, you know, participating via social media. Uh, we're out there watching. Great discussion occurring. Please join the discussion with this, this hashtag. The next town hall will be August 4th and then August 25th. So looking forward to continuing to have you with us uh, during this. Uh, this. And that's all uh, for now from uh, our New York office live. Lisa, Barry, great being in person with you today. Thank you both, and uh, pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.